Welcome back to Unmasking the Trans Movement with John Euler. I'm your host, Brad Wilder. Another great show on the way today, part two with Megan Fox. Boy, she's a world of information. I tell you what, uh, she has her foot and hand in the pulse of it all, and um, she's uh, knee-deep in it. She uh, definitely has uh, a ton of experience, knowledge, and a lot to talk to our listeners about today. John, welcome back to the show. As always, we love having you, and uh, John... Um, Megan has, uh, in part one, kind of really gave us a good understanding of, of what the trans movement and what her career has brought her to become this, this activist and, uh, to, against this trans movement. And, um, you know, we got that picture. So where are we headed from here in part two, John? We're headed to look at and review some of the books that uh, Megan has written. She's written a couple of them. The first is so pertinent to, and it comes on the heels of our interview with Dan Kleinman of Safe Libraries, and it turns out that she interacted very extensively with Dan Kleinman in the writing of her book that described the concerns she had and what she was experiencing at her local library. So Megan, welcome back. It's a privilege to have you. Uh, first of all, tell people how they can tune into your various uh, podcasts. You also write for PJ Media. You can find all my writing at pjmedia.com. I am uh, I write there almost every day, columns in investigative journalism. Uh, I'm also on Locals, which I love. I'm doing meganfox.locals.com. I do some uh, some really fun stuff there. I'm doing like home ec with a little bit of true crime on top uh, for my subscribers on Locals. If you're not on Locals, you need to be because it's a great social media that is tell, tell anti-censorship. Tell people where they can find that, Megan, because your show, uh, I found it very engaging. You, you're you a dog lover. You have a dog. And just, <laughs> you, you have where people can join you for a movie. So uh, tell the uh, viewers, where can they find that? Yeah, so Locals. Locals is a great app. You can do download it on your phone, and then you can go to meganfox.locals.com. Sign up for my community there. You can follow me for free. If you want to take part in the stuff that's for subscribers, it's only $5 a month. Uh, and what we do is we do, I have movie nights. We watch true crime documentaries together because that's something that I'm really into. And of course, I do true crime Tuesdays on YouTube on uh, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I have a live stream that I do on YouTube, Rumble and Facebook live and uh, that you guys can find under Megan Fox Investigates. But my locals page is really just for the fun stuff. I'm doing homemaking. I'm a mom. You know, that's what I do. So I, I help people clean. I help people cook. And we're doing freezer meal Fridays. Uh, this Friday, I'm cooking 10 meals at one once uh, we're all doing it together anybody who signs up for it we stock our freezer with um, 10 delicious meals so that you're not running at the end of the day trying to figure out something good for your family it's it's hard to keep up um especially in in a in a recession and we've got these high grocery prices so i'm, I'm helping people save money over there and save their time which is precious as well um and, and me being a mom uh, is really affects what I do. And that brings me to my book that we were going to talk about. It was the first book that I wrote with my friend, Kevin Dujan. Uh, he was a, a, a a writer in Chicago, and he and I stumbled into this story. This book is called Shut Up, The Bizarre War That One Public Library Waged Against the First Amendment. That's my mom on the cover, by the way. She really plays up the the nasty librarian really well. We still get such a kick out of this book cover. But Kevin and I were, in, I was homeschooling at the time and he would, uh, he was one of my good friends in Chicago and he would come with us on our, our fun outings to take the kids to do things like, um, and to take them to museums. And so we would often do our schooling around town. Uh, and that day we happened to be at the Orland Park Public Library. We were taking the kids there to do, uh, some, worksheets and just hang out in the children's library because it's a beautiful library there in Orland Park, Illinois. And um, that for some reason that day, they refused to let me use the computers on the children's in the children's area, even though I had children with me and I wanted to print out their their little worksheets that I had done for them. And they wouldn't let me use them. And they demanded that I go up to the adult computer room to use a computer, even though there was no one there, no one at the children's computers. It was really bizarre. So I said, I don't feel comfortable bringing my children up to the adult computer area. So I, I asked Kevin to stay with the kids and I would go upstairs and get what I needed. I got up there and within 30 to 45 seconds of me sitting down at a computer, 
there was a man within my view right in the row in front of me watching pornography right out there in the open in the middle of the day the teen area is right across from us the he's within view of this book stacks you know i mean it wasn't hidden in any way and i was so flustered by it i got so uncomfortable i couldn't even focus on what i was doing and i got up and i left and i ran back downstairs and i said to kevin you're not going to believe this but what's going on up there but take your phone and go up there and see if you can get pictures of this see what you're see if you see what i'm seeing he goes up, he walks up and down every row. He finds three people, three men doing this in, in the middle of the day. Um, so I said, they must not know. We, we must say, I have to say, I have to tell someone. So I went to the girl who was at the front desk and I said, hey, um, do you know about this? Do you know that there's guys up there right now watching porn? And she goes, oh, yeah, we get a lot of those. Oh, that was their response. So doing what I would normally do as just a mom, a concerned citizen, I wrote in uh, a letter to the director of the library and I copied the board and I told them about what that experience was like for me. And I almost exposed my children to it because if I had listened to that librarian and taken them upstairs, they would have been exposed to pornography and they were like five and three or six and three at the time. So I went up, I, I sent her this letter and I asked for a response and she not only didn't she never responded it was like 31 days went by with no response but she did call the police and have me investigated the police of Orland Park started investigating my YouTube page now, I'm not kidding this is not a joke I mean you'd think that it, it is a joke but it's not she started having me investigated um I found that out through FOIA requests later on I, I had to go to a board meeting and my first board meeting I ever attended was at this library to tell them, hey, I sent you this letter. I got no response. And this is not the correct way to respond to people who use your library when they run into things like this. And I couldn't understand the silence. That first board meeting and they were so hostile to me. It's on my YouTube page. So hostile to me um that it really launched a three-year war of atonement between my Kevin at the time was a, a political activist and he's not something someone I would ever tangle with you know you get him angry and he's just going to keep on going at you for the rest of your life and he and I started foying this library and we what we found is unconscionable we found over 20 reports that women had made about men being sexually aggressive in the library, some of them breaking laws, masturbating in the library, and none of these reports were given to the police. The police were not notified. Instead, they would move the woman to a different computer. One man, a woman reported she thought he was watching child porn, and they refused to call the police. They did not call the police, and they even have a little checkbox on their incident report that says, were police called yes or no? And on the one with the child porn, they said no. This is when I reached out to Dan Kleinman. When we found those reports, I reached out to Dan Kleinman. I was like, Dan, he, who I consider to be the world's expert on public libraries, because he's truly studied this for so long. I said, Dan, this is unbelievable. This can't be real. This can't be happening, that they're covering up sex crimes in a library. Why would they do that? And that's what led to this incredible book, this incredible investigation where we get to the bottom of who did this to public libraries, what is behind it. And it's deep. And I know it looks like a huge book. It is written like a mystery novel. It's very entertaining. Um, it's very funny. And at the same time, will make you very angry. You can pick it up on Amazon. But all the problems parents are having now with these boards, you know, where they're going to the boards, at their, whether it's the school or a library about the pornographic books and everything else, all the questions you have about why that happened are in this book. And also, it's a great guide to help you fight against a bad board. A too long didn't read version is we had using the Freedom of Information Act and the Open Meetings Act, we were able to hold that public library accountable for what they did to us by breaking the law during their meetings and violating our constitutional rights by violating the rights of the public by not calling for the police. It ended in a $55,000 judgment in our favor that a judge was like, we've I've had enough of this. Uh, <laughs> they win. And it was it was great. Um, and 
all these people fighting public boards right now, you need this book. It'll teach you everything you need to know about how to write FOIAs, how to use these laws against these government agents, because that's what they are, they're government agents. And you need to learn how to make your government accountable to you. Megan, people need to understand that when we had Dan Kleinman on, after the program we were talking and we had just referenced about men accessing porn on library computers. And I said, well, Dan, in sex under treatment, that's a common method. These guys disclose that. And Dan's eyes got big. I said, yeah. He says, well, people don't know that. So I want people to understand 14 plus years now clinically working in forensic uh, population, parents need to understand that pedophiles will do whatever they need to do to be able to access kids and then groom kids. Pornography, ever since pornography was launched with Hugh Hefner, then the internet, you'll never find a sex offense that is unrelated to pornography. Pornography now is the is the uh, one common denominator among all men who sexually offend. These men will specifically go into libraries and they they're grooming. So they uh, position themselves, pardon the pun, uh, put on pornography, and they access the computers that are most visually um, available, uh, look at a glance, to kids. So these guys are purposely going in. I had a number of guys that were in my sex offender treatment groups that either that was their offense when they were finally busted or part of their offense, or these guys were on parole. So these were sex offenders. These were registered sex offenders. And they were still gaining access to kids under the guise of they're going into the library to job hunt. So when a librarian who is a mandated reporter does not report this, she's in violation of the law. Uh, and this is not um, this is not isolated. These are not separate. What you and Dan connected, as far as you saw the, you know, you saw these things starting to uh, be brought into libraries and school libraries are also being facilitated by these same librarians that are being uh, influenced and trained by the American Library Association, which you cover in your book, Dan mentioned. So parents need to understand this is an active effort to sexually groom kids. As, uh, grooming is overriding and overcoming uh, intuition. And then you're also implanting or you're introducing concepts that kids are not able to uh, deal with. Now you've uh, you've really dumbed down and primed these kids uh, to where predators have a very easy time of it. And you as a mother and as a journalist then has significant concerns about it. Yeah, one of the things I discovered in our investigation was that the reason why some of these guys were going to the library to, to do these things and commit crimes, like look at child porn, is because they know that the library wipes their servers every night. We discovered through FOIA, uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, that they have a like a bleach bit software that just knocks out everything every night. So if someone did commit a crime and the police were notified, the, unless the police could get the servers immediately that day, they would be completely out of out of luck. They would not be able to trace. And the library was not even attaching a library card number to the computer terminal. So you could just walk up there and get a little slip of paper with a code on it without giving them your name or anything and go log on to a computer. Now, some people are like, well, privacy matters. Where do we have privacy anymore. I don't have privacy on my home computer. It's all, everything's on the cloud. If I commit a crime, the FBI or whoever's going to take my computer and get everything I've ever done off of it. So you're telling me that the only place you can have privacy is in a public library and they're specifically covering up for crime? Because that's what was happening. That's literally what was happening. And I want to be very clear that not all libraries um, adhere to the American Library uh, association standards like this. If your library um, 
is a very big ALA pusher. They will be just like this. But there are some libraries who don't want anything to do with this type of um, thing. We did an investigation into other libraries in the area, and we found one library director in New Lenox, Illinois, who was so good, she knew who the local wanted sex offenders were, and she caught one in her library and called, locked him in a room and called the police because he wasn't supposed to be near children. And so, and he was accessing that material in violation of his probation in her library and she made sure he got caught now that's a hero librarian right there uh, so there are libraries that are not doing this sort of thing but the american library association has got its tentacles into almost every library and and you should be very very um aware of what's happening in your library but i highly recommend the book please pick it up on amazon it, it's also in a kindle version uh, which still has a lot of the links and things even though it was written years ago it's so relevant for today for the challenges we're facing i kind of feel like a seer having having written it because we were ahead of the game uh many years ago about these board wars that were going to happen yeah you were and um you know, where parents think of all places, I can drop my kid off at the library. It's going to be safe. There's personnel to watch him. I can go run a few errands. I'll come back. My kid's going to be, you know, the worst they can do is start reading. Uh, you know, they feel surrounded with books. And lo and behold, then uh, deviant predators have been on and therefore they leave these pages up. Kids get on mm. a computer and look what's there. And there's no trace then. Uh, to find out who did this and so to think that your kids potentially are accessing uh, direct access to video porn right at the libraries that is not by accident Megan, you oh, and at the by the way the harold washington library in downtown chicago actually had a sex assault on a four-year-old and an eight-year-old child in and they allow this to happen and there was a huge cbs investigation into it with undercover camera work and everything uh and nothing ever happened to the library they were not forced to change their policies of letting men watch porn even after two sexual assaults happened on children children in the inside the harold washington library what a crime what a crime this is the kind of thing parents need to stand up against and say no more enough this is public funds these libraries are paid for by the public and the supreme court by the way in ala uh v um uh us us v ala uh ruled that public libraries have no um obligation to give free internet access without any filters and that in fact if they want uh, federal funds they must filter for for the safety of children and they're getting around it by eschewing the federal funds that's how badly they want to show porn in a library they will turn down money from the federal government to keep the porn flowing in the library the, the supreme court already ruled that there's no educational value in porno in providing pornography there's no obligation for a library to use taxpayer dollars to do it and so, but they're, they're, at, they're actually going against the Supreme Court ruling so they can keep doing it. That same association, the American Library Association, is having direct influence into school libraries. Speak to us about your concerns. Speak to parents about the, what's happening in school libraries with these different books. The ALA puts out lists every year of their award-winning books. And you can be assured that anything that wins an award from the ALA is going to be a piece of trash. They are not awarding books that are good literature. They are literally awarding all the books that are the most sexually explicit, that contain drug use, alcohol abuse, uh, all kinds of degeneracy that you would not want your little ones reading. Uh, maybe that would be more appropriate for teenagers, but we're talking about young little children i have found in but i used to do this thing where i would go in the library and i can you can do it you can try it it's, it's amazing how it works just run your hands along the young adult sections just start pulling books go sit down and start flipping through them within a few pages you will find extreme vulgarity you will find sex you will find drugs you and in the majority of these books that's what's in there and they're picking these on purpose uh, there is no such thing as good young adult literature anymore or if, if there is it's buried it's it's mostly the content creators i know who have been creating alternative content for conservative audiences to stay away from this stuff 
But the the ALA is is creating these book lists that then the school librarians are given this list and some of them don't even know. They'll just be emailed this list and they'll they'll order the books for their school. And it's all LGBTQ gender cult programming, all of it. It's all it's it's disgusting. And in every book you read, there isn't one with a normal functional family. It's all families that are divorced or um, just trauma, in, lots of trauma, lots of, you wouldn't want to read these books. You would come away feeling darkened after reading these books, but this is what they're putting in front of the kids. Um, parents have an absolute right to know what their children are reading and to say, no, I don't want my children, my child, my minor child reading that. And that's what a lot of these um, board wars are about right now, are parents saying to the schools, you better back off my kid. You better stop giving them these books. There's even kids showing up at board meetings reading from the book saying this makes me uncomfortable i don't want to be groomed by pedophiles please stop putting these pedophile books in our libraries and this is all because of the ala and they will they'll pitch a huge fit and they'll say it's censorship and these are book burners and all this nonsense it, it isn't because all of those books are available to you out in for purchase privately if you want your kid to read that kind of smut you go buy that book for them, but don't you dare uh, let the library in the school put those books in the view of children whose parents don't want them to see that degenerate crap. It's not okay. Megan, I've, I've told people that uh, they need to be very concerned about these books because if the men in my current sex offender treatment groups were found to be in possession of any of these books, they would be violated out of group and sent back to prison. People need to understand that's how bad these books are. These are the kind of books that pedophiles use to groom kids. Megan, along with the concern you've just mentioned about school boards, so parents are bringing these concerns and the school boards are shutting them down. We learned from Alvin, you just uh, referred to it. There's an actual library board. So, um, so Dan Kleinman, was uh, was suggesting people get on that board. So we need to start yes. taking power away from those that would seek to groom kids. You've written a second book that I think is very, very uh, pertinent to this discussion because those that are interested in shifting culture, in capturing the hearts and minds of kids to where you can, they become easily manipulated. They become, there's an old fashioned phrase, useful idiots where these mm. kids then are manipulated, they are, you kind of wind them up and point them in a certain direction, meaning you you impact a young person's sex and sexuality. Now they are ripe for the picking. They are easily manipulated. Cults know that. Uh, predators know that. Something happened in our culture to really create the other prong of the approach to silence any anyone parent or any concerned citizen uh, that would begin to try to erect or, or put back barriers and push back predators. So the one is, you know, they're calling uh, parents that raise concerns about pornography as old fashioned or, you know, uh, Purian or- Terrorists. Okay, there we go. Now the other <laughs> is how they've learned certain tactics are very effective at silencing any opposition. And you wrote a book stemming from the Kavanaugh hearings mm -hmm. that focused on techniques and what was unleashed during that that really has had very profound impact upon causing good people to hesitate to speak up. Talk to us about the second book. It is in, in, uh, titled Believe Evidence, the Death of Due Process from Salome to the Me Too movement. Um, mm -hmm. I was excited as I was Looking through the chapters, you've listed off um, names that I have listed off. So talk to us about that book, why you felt compelled, and how that also has implications to what we're dealing with, even including parents that are trying to speak up in front of school boards. Sure. So in Believe Evidence, um, you know, at the time that the Kavanaugh hearings were going on, there was a hashtag going around Twitter, uh, believe all women. And I thought, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I mean, do these people not know women? Have they never heard about women who who lie and cheat and steal and murder and do all these things? Throughout history and literature, the, 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 the examples are numerous. Um, there are famous bad women, you know, 
everywhere. The idea that women are somehow exempt from the norm from normal human behavior is outrageous. And what I was seeing at the time was a coordinated uh, attempt to cancel anyone the left didn't want in power by ginning up false accusations and false accusers. It was a Salem witch trials all over again, which is also in this book, um, talking about, you know, how these mass hysteria events take hold, where eventually there's, you know, some 15 year old who says, uh, I saw Goody, uh, Goody, this one down by the river uh, doing, you know, dancing with Satan and you're, and then you start hanging people. Um, that has happened in our history. That's a true story. And it's happening. It continues to happen. There is something within the human spirit or heart that desires to um, lie about, to bear false witness against thy neighbor for your own um, advancement or whatever it is. I mean, that's why the, the Ten Commandments uh, include do not bear false witness against your neighbor. That is a that is a sin. Um, and yet I see these women and the Me Too movement was all about this. Some of the claims may have been true, but they, they wanted to change our culture, our actual justice system from innocent unless proven guilty to guilty unless proven innocent. And, and that is cancel culture. dangerous. That's the cancel culture right there. That was perfected during that that episode. And now they learned the power of various, uh, every, uh, the techniques were really perfected during that time, Megan. Yeah, it is like a psyop um, on people to to make them forget that they have, uh, that we have a constitution, that we have due process. And, and no one seems to understand what due process is anymore. And if you're going to accuse someone of a crime, you have to be able to back it up with evidence. You cannot just accuse someone of a crime with no evidence because we call that defamation. If it's not true, uh, and, and the only and you must prove it true. So this book is interesting because I go through history and literature and current events as well. And I name and tell stories of women who lied in order to get advancement or a, a, a better view or I mean, there's it's amazing the kinds of things women will lie about. Um, and in it, I also talk about how to help your kids avoid uh, these women for one, or how to avoid becoming one of these women. And one of the one of the problems I see, uh, and the reason why we have this situation where people are willing to bear false witness against their neighbor, is because they have not been raised with any solid moral um, background and foundation. So. In my, I believe it's very important to take your kids to church, to bring them up in your religion, whatever that religion is, because almost all or all of the uh, major religions have a moral code. This is something people need, something they need uh, in order to ground them in truth and keep them from doing terrible things to one another, like lying and uh, trying to cancel people uh, on a lie. I mean, now we've uh, just last week, I think one of the accusers of Brett Kavanaugh finally came out and admitted she never even even met the man. So this was a calculated uh destroy it was a calculated um I, I what is the word? Uh it, it's, it's a calculated organized uh destruction of someone. We're seeing it with the Marilyn Manson uh thing happening too with his lawsuit and the women who have accused him. One of them has finally come out just last week and said I was pressured into lying. He never did these things. Uh, this is this is done by people who are social climbers. They want attention. They want fame. And of course, we've we've developed a society now where people think that they're not worthwhile or their lives are not worthwhile unless they are famous in some way. And some people will do anything to get that. And it's uh, it's really sad and it's dangerous. And we need to uphold the Constitution and get back to making sure that we give people due process and not cancel them in, with a rage mob. That's right. And those tactics that have been used extensively now, and parents and good people need to be aware of it. Alvin Louie of Courage is a Habit. He does a magnificent job helping people understand. And Megan, you and Louie uh, are good professional colleagues with that. Uh, his The way he describes how cults and manipulators will go after the language and look at what's happened with Jordan Peterson. His license, professional license, is on the line. He was, uh, you know, they went after him as a uh, eminent psychologist, uh, right? He no longer has his teaching position. 
Uh, I've had my license investigated. Why? Because a bunch of the trans per, uh, you know, predator apologists um, complained. No client of mine has ever complained. Who complained? I touched on the issue of furries, who are the deviant individuals dressing in costumes or the people that dress in costumes that often do deviant stuff. Predators use those. Once I mentioned about furries, they ginned up all, they called them brigades and they went after my employment. They went after my professional license. The, the genesis of that, they're really perfecting the art of being able to, to silence people, to make people fearful of, of stepping up and saying anything. So now you have this two prong approach. If a parent is agitated, understandably, because he or she is protective, they see pornography in libraries, what's going on in schools. They're going to go to the, uh, to the school board, well, they know they're going to be hit with this two-prong approach. One is offensive and defensive, so to speak, uh, that the parent is going to be besieged, the fact that they're phobic, as well as then retribution and retaliation. You received that, that behind the scenes you found out that this librarian was actively targeting you by having police begin to investigate you. So it's a very real fearful thing. Megan, what do you say to those parents that have been now uh, almost uh, brought into a position of silence. They're hesitant to say anything because of these tactics and what's happened in the culture. It's been very effective. I, I say that I understand. I mean, not everybody has a job like I do whose boss just laughs when he's contacted about my bad behavior or whatever they want to say. You know, we we collect those emails and we we pass them around the office and we all laugh. I'm not going to lose my job. I can't be canceled because we're the anti-cancel people. So I, but I understand that that people are truly afraid of this because I've seen it happen to people. I've seen their entire lives get turned upside down. There's a guy in Chicago who offered um, one of the groups that wanted to speak out against the gender ideology he he let them book his uh displays theater and then when the activists got a hold of that they targeted him the owner of the theater and they threatened him with destroying him professionally so he had no choice but to take back the offer um and I spoke to him and I wanted, I, I kind of wanted to shake him and be like, well, somebody needs to stand up and say no to these bullies. Someone needs to. Do, and he's like, well, I agree, but I've got a family to feed. So, you know, we, it really, they have perfected this way of fighting that is very down and dirty in the gutter. And a lot of conservatives don't want to fight back in the same way. Uh, I have been a proponent of using the rules of rules for radicals against them because that's what they're using. Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals. And if you notice on the cover of my book, uh, that's what the librarian is holding. Uh, because in this book, I, we go into detail what are the rules for radicals and how they can be turned and used against the system. And that's what we did. And, and look, I was, I was, um, I was constantly, and it's in this book, I was constantly being criticized by Christian people, by the good people of the world, by conservatives who said they didn't like my tone and they wouldn't help me because my tone wasn't exactly the way they wanted it to be. That's what we're up against with conservatives. They don't know how to fight. They don't, they, they don't know how to take the gloves off. They, they, they reject ridicule and ridicule is your greatest weapon. That's what Saul Alinsky taught us, that ridicule is your greatest weapon. And you can't go after institutions because institutions don't bleed. You have to go after pr people personally. So if there's a library that's doing this, you go after the library director personally. You make her, her job miserable. These are are the rules that we now live in and we can use them to stop these institutions from doing what they're doing and that's the only way we're going to win and i know people disagree with me but when you're at war and this is a war it's time to stop tying your hands because you think you're better than that i say cancel culture will only stop when they get canceled too I will tell you, it's good to raise your child knowing about these issues and understanding what is so important and talking to them about it. Honestly, uh, my children are, are are great at recognizing attempts at brainwashing them, and they tell me about it all the time. Megan, you, uh, you're a wealth of knowledge. And just as in the days of Elijah, which uh, shows the method he had to use when you had uh, Jezebel, who's one of the women in your book, 
Uh, she propped up the priests of Baal, and ultimately they were sacrificing children, and Elijah said enough, and so he and God uh, did a frontal assault. He was he took the gloves off, and it is, as far as um, being very forthright, we need to call evil evil. We need to go on the offensive because there's too much at stake. Uh, Megan, your voice is out there. You're, you're confronting the darkness. I appreciate it so much having you on as our guest. If you are good enough to accept my invitation, we'll have you back. Uh, I encourage Anytime. people to access your website, your programs, your podcasts are very engaging. You love your dog. It's just a kick to watch uh, your your different uh, podcasts about that. Uh, so thank you so much, Megan, for being a wonderful guest, an informative guest on Unmasking the Trans Movement. Well, thanks for having me. Megan Fox yeah. Investigates is where you want to go to see Megan's information online. You can find more great podcasts and journalism from Megan. Thanks again for being here today, both of you. Um, this is Unmasking the Trans Movement, a little dose of what's really going on in our world and reality for our kids and the future that seems to be somewhat awaiting their arrival. I'm Brad Wilder. We'll see you next time.